Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show. This thing called TMD, it can freak you out a little bit. You don't know how to treat it. You're thinking, who should I refer this to? I don't know what to do. Well, today I bring on a great mentor of ours, Dr. Jim McKee. And he shares an awesome framework on why it's time to rethink TMD and why it might be an incredible opportunity for your practice. So please listen up. I know you'll enjoy this one. And have a great day. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show. I hope you guys are enjoying this because we're going to keep bringing it with some of the best thinkers, teachers, speakers anywhere in the world. And today you're going to hear from one of my favorite mentors of all time, Dr. Jim McKee, who is not only a great friend and incredible teacher, but he's kind of like my personal therapist too. He helps me with things that I'm just thinking about in the world of dentistry because I don't know that anybody's ever done as many study clubs as he has. And today we're going to be talking about why it's time to rethink TMD. Jim, thanks for being back, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks for the opportunity, Kirk. Always great to be with you. Yeah. Now I want you guys to know who Jim is. You, he's been on the podcast before, but he's coming off the heels of running the AES meeting. Maybe you can talk about what that is. Uh, you're also part of the Restorative Academy. You can talk about what that is. And then you also have an amazing sure. study club. And for the young listeners, I just want you to know the world of education and the possibilities out there. So just talk about your week last week, Jim, real quickly. Last week was one of my favorite weeks of the year. Why? Uh, the American Equilibration Society is a meeting that actually Pete Dawson recommended I go to 30 years ago. And really, AES, honestly, it's probably one of the best deals in CE, to be completely honest with you. You know, I think it's $1,500 for two days of world-class speakers, lunch both days, a beautiful reception. I mean, really, for CE, it's great for the dollar, for the value for the dollar. The purpose of the organization is really studies occlusion and, and restorative dentistry. You know, it's really supposed to be the best meeting in the world, the best two-day meeting in the world for occlusion, TMD, and restorative dentistry. So... Last week, we had a fabulous meeting. Um, we had a radiologist. I presented with Tom Preddy. He's a radiologist that I worked with. We talked about joint diagnosis. Bill Robbins and Jim Otten kicked off the program with global diagnosis. Seth Atkins talked about virtual articulation. And then we had an afternoon of three oral surgeons, Mike Gunson, Reza Movahead, and Brian Shaw, all with differing treatment philosophies. They did 45 minute presentations and we had a panel discussion for 45 minutes where we asked some questions outlining the differences in their philosophy. So it was really cool. The next day we had Domingo Martin, who's an unbelievably great orthodontist from San Sebastian, Spain, followed by George Mandelaris, who's a periodontist from Chicago, both experts in their field. And they both had, the title was the same. And the title was, we asked them to talk about occlusion and TMD from the orthodontist perspective for Domingo, and then from the periodontist perspective for George. So that was really well done. After that, we had three dentists, Pete Lemieux, Lynn Lipskis, and Leanne Brady. And what they did is they all talked about how they would handle a 26-year-old female class two patient who has clicking in the left joints. It was kind of a nice little quick way to get information, three different perspectives. They had 15 minutes each. And then we talked general 15 minute questions back and forth. The afternoon was really a cool afternoon. We had John Coyce and Marta Revlon, who is his uh, scientific person he works with. And they talked about digital dentistry today, what works and doesn't work. John received a presidential award from the American Equilibration Society for his contributions over the years. And then he wrote up with Frank Spear, who talked about occlusion and TMD from the prosthodontic perspective, 
And we also gave Frank a presidential award again for his graciousness over the years and participating in the meeting. So it was an awesome, awesome two days. Um, and then the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry is Saturday, Sunday in Chicago. And that's, you know, that's usually the premier meeting in dentistry. Um, that's an invitation only academy. So you have to know someone to get an invite. Um, but it's really a cool organization. I'm a past president that I was president of that right before COVID. So uh, I was glad we were able to get the meeting in before COVID shut everything down. But again, that's a, that's a really special organization. So if you ever get an opportunity to go to that meeting, if you happen to know someone and they say, would you like to go to the AARD in Chicago? Always say yes. Yeah. So came home Monday, did some laundry, went to Aero Tuesday, and I'm out at uh, Scottsdale now because I'm teaching the Advanced Occlusion Workshop at Spear on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Well, that's why I'm so grateful that you would even carve out some time. You're one of the busiest guys. You do it on your own terms, and it's really fun. But there's, you guys, I'm just telling you, there's nobody that's immersed with so much good thinking more than Jim is. And today, we're going to bend your thinking a little bit. And we're going to re, you know, why it's time. Let's start with the why, Jim. Why is it time to rethink the TMD patient? Let's start with the big picture. The why? The why really is because, honestly, I think it's the best way to build a practice that gives you the opportunity to insulate yourself from the insurance system. Now, let me rephrase that because there's multiple whys. That's one. The second why is because the patients need this treatment. So we've, we haven't really fulfilled our responsibility to patients in this field. We've kind of brushed them off. Um, we need to own this joint. This is our territory. And I think the days that we're going to say, I'm going to refer this out of the office, I think those days are ending. We're going to talk about this. The third why is because it touches everything we do. It touches the restorative side, it touches the orthodontic side, it touches the orthodontic side, it touches the airway side. And yes, some of those patients have pain as well. But the whys are really patients need it. There's too much of it to refer out. And ultimately, it's an opportunity to build a practice that can be rock solid practice, even in the most difficult of times. Yeah. You know, I, I look back at our numbers, Kurt. You know, even in 08 when everything tanked and even when we had problems, our numbers didn't go down simply because the demand is so great for this type of service. But, you know, we don't think about it that way. Right. Now, I've been doing this a long time. You've been doing it way longer than me. Let's go right there. The stigma. The stigma is still there. Can you just talk about what that is? Well, you know, when a dentist hears, let's say your front desk person comes up and says, I've got a TMD patient on the phone. If you're the dentist, usually four things go through your head. Number one, it's a pain patient. Right. Number two, is that the pain is from clenching and grinding due to stress. Number three is, mm, I don't know how to treat this. <laughs> and number four is, who can I refer this to? So let's talk the pain side first. You know, it's interesting. We've made TMD about pain. Honestly, pain's almost the last thing that occurs when you have a TMD problem. It's like any other disease process. Most of the time, there's structural change before we have pain. The far, far, far more common clinical presentation is a change in how the teeth fit together. And basically, the easiest way to think about it, it's the class two occlusion. If there's a class two occlusion, my hope is that after listening to this podcast, that you're going to start to think that maybe there's a structural reason for the class two occlusion, as opposed to the fact that maybe the patient just got a bad roll of the genetic DNA dice. They got their dad's upper jaw and their mom's lower jaw. If it was genetic, 
when we image those cases, you'd see normal joints. They'd just be smaller. That's not what you see. So the reality is, and I think the first thing that we have to understand is that the primary clinical presentation of a patient with a joint issue is a class two occlusion. Now, that's a little bit of an uncomfortable statement because if you call your orthodontist up and you say, hey, what percentage of your new patients are class two? You know what your orthodontist is going to tell you? 50, 60, 75 percent. The class ones, a lot of general dentists are doing using Invisalign. Patients have done it with do-it-yourself methods. The orthodontic practice is becoming the class two dumping ground. So here's the, there's, there's always an opportunity if you right. really think about it. The opportunity is start recognizing those class two patients before you send them to the orthodontist, do the workup like we'll talk about in a second, and then send them. Don't just send them, send them with information that now makes the orthodontist job easier. So the problem is we need to change our way of thinking from this being a pain patient to this basically being an occlusal patient. Right. That's the first thing. Yeah. Now let me, can I just add on the, the uneven, but the opportunity now exists. Let's go a little bit deeper in that first one. There's a tool, it's imaging, it's changed the game. How can I use that? Just checking off that first box you mentioned. Well, you know, it's interesting because when you go back to the why, as you said, why does this happen? We were always taught that this is because clenching and grinding. And generally, clenching or grinding were due to a couple of reasons. One was stress. The other was we didn't have an even bite. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably some truth in both of those. But... Ultimately, what we started to realize is that many times the reason we may clench and grind due to stress or due to an uneven bite is because there's been a structural alteration at the joint level. If you think about this three-dimensionally, think of the disc as a gasket in the joint. And think of the disc as something that positions the condyle three-dimensionally in space so that when we close, we have an even bite each time we close. So as long as the disc or the gasket is there, soft tissue between two harder surfaces would be the definition of a gasket. As long as that disc can position the condyle three-dimensionally in space, we'll have an even bite. If, however, we lose the gasket, it increases the chance that now the condyle is going to change position and so is our bike going to change position. So all of a sudden now, what's the tooth that becomes the most common tooth that will contact if we have a change in the joint? It's the last tooth in the arch. That's the second molar. That's why that's the tooth we've prepped more. That's the tooth that cracks more. That's the one that has marginal ridge cracks going down the side of it. That's why it's the tooth that almost every restorative dentist has prepped more than any other posterior tooth in their career because it's the one that takes the beating. So when we talk about clenching and grinding, let's talk about why we clench and grind. One is how the teeth fit together. I do think we have to get the teeth to fit together. The other is the sympathetic side of this discussion, which gets discussed more in the airway world than it does in the joint world. But you've got the same situation that occurs. If we have structural alterations in the joint, we were used to thinking that changes in joint anatomy led to pain coming from tissues that were being loaded incorrectly. What we didn't understand is that also the nerves were injured. So what we started to see is sympathetic nerve activity increase the fight or flight system and one of the byproducts of that is muscle dystonia. So really, when we talk about clenching and grinding or bruxism today, honestly, I think sympathetically induced muscle dystonia 
from airway issues, from joint issues, from upper cervical spine issues, really explain clenching and grinding better than anything that I've heard so far. So ultimately, we thought that this was a bite issue and we thought that a bad bite would cause a bad joint. I think we have to rethink that and realize that a bad joint causes a bad bite. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. And part of it is, you know, we're going to go to box number three is like, I don't know how to treatment plan this. We kind of stay in that limbo where it's just, you know. Um, well, you know, you, you mentioned imaging before. You know, it's interesting. Most dentists, you know, if you peek behind the curtain to dental mating, they're going to tell you, I don't want to treat TMD patients. You know, we don't know how to treat this. We weren't taught very well. We don't know what type of splint to make. You know, I make a hard splint. You make a soft splint. Right. Do you make a splint that just covers the front teeth? Do you make a splint that just covers the back teeth? How thick is the splint? None of that has been taught very well, honestly, in our profession. Right. And that's the reality of it. <clears throat> because what you're doing, really, is you're treating a joint-based problem at the tooth level. See, when we used to think that muscle caused the problem, we assumed the joint was normal. And if you got the bite right, the muscles would calm down and the problem would be solved. That's true for some patients, but not for all patients. So really, my thinking started to change when I started imaging younger patients. I didn't realize that this happened as early in life as it did. Makes sense when you think about the orthodontic discussion we just had a couple of minutes ago. If you've got all these 12 and 13 year olds, especially females, presenting with class two occlusions, retronathic mandibles, facial asymmetries, it makes sense that something isn't growing. Well, the most common reason, and number two isn't close, that the lower jaw, the mandible, or the upper jaw, the maxilla doesn't grow is the fact that the disc isn't covering the bone. Now, a lot of people will make the argument that the tongue isn't pushing the maxilla as well either, but I'm going to counter that argument by saying if the maxilla isn't out as far as it should be, it's pretty much impossible for the tongue to reach where it needs to be. So we've ignored the joint way too long in terms of growth and development, and I think once we start to image, especially at a younger age, we start to realize that here's the interesting thing. Most of the adult malocclusions that we see, the cross bites, the open bites, the overjet problems, the canted planes, the facial asymmetries are all the result of childhood joint injuries and they didn't grow well. Now, I'm always careful to say all, so let's say 99.5%. <laughs> but most of the cases, you know, Frank Spears said something a long time ago that stuck with me. Frank said, what are, the, what are the cases that sit on your desk the longest when you're treatment planning? He goes, it's the ones where the teeth aren't in the right place. And I'll tell you today, looking back at my experience, the biggest reason that I see why the teeth aren't in the right place is because we're not dealing with a normal joint. That's the issue, because if we grow and we have contact, it'll maintain tooth position. When things aren't growing, things start to over erupt, then we start to get bites that don't fit very well. So that's why I think imaging changes the whole discussion. I was lecturing out in Scottsdale, I don't know, five or six years ago. And a woman came up to me and said, I'm really afraid of treating TMJ patients. And I said, I totally understand. And I said, how do you feel about doing endo? She goes, I love doing endo. I said, okay. Say a patient comes into you and they have a curious exposure on an upper left first molar. Would you want to do the root canal? She goes, sure, I do the root canal. I said, would you start the root canal if your x-ray machine was broken that day? She got this look on her face. So I say, you have, to start the, you have to start the root canal without any imaging. And she goes, no. I said, why not? 
She goes, well, I wouldn't understand how much decay was there. I wouldn't understand how curved the canals were. I wouldn't understand how calcified the canals were. So really, I said, what you're using imaging for is to identify the anatomic risk factors that you're dealing with in your treatment plan so you can have a realistic prognosis discussion with your patient. If the decay is all the way through the frication involvement on the upper, upper left first molar, you're not going to do the root canal because it's going to be a non-restorable tooth. If you've got a really calcified canal, you're going to tell the patient, we're going to do the best we can, but we've got a calcified canal or we're going to see what we need to do. You So all of a sudden now your prognosis discussion becomes intertwined with your imaging because that's what's really giving you your anatomic risk factors. I said it's no different with making an appliance for a patient who has joint pain. All of a sudden, if I take an MRI now and I can see that they have swelling in the marrow space, that's a higher risk problem. If I can see they have a really big, thick disc sitting out in front of a tiny condyle, that's a bigger problem. If I can see they have really compressed airway anatomy at the pharyngeal area, or they've got a really deviated septum so they can't breathe through their nose, or they've got real inflamed tonsils and adenoids, all of a sudden that becomes a risk factor now. So what imaging does, it allows you to understand your anatomic risk factors. So now you can have a reasonable thought process about your treatment plan, and you can have a reasonable discussion with your patient about the risks for your treatment plan and the treatment options that they're thinking about. So that's really the advantage, I think, of imaging you know, because I was the same way. I never wanted to treat joint patients because I didn't know what I was doing. Mark Piper is the oral surgeon that I worked with for 30 years before Mark, 35 years before Mark retired. And really, Mark was the one that opened my eyes to MRI and CT imaging. And once you can see the anatomy, all the fear about treating TMD patients kind of melts away because now you know what you're dealing with. So... That's why the imaging, as you said, is I think it's the same as endo. How confident are you going to be if you don't have an x-ray in front of you before you start the endo? Same discussion. Yeah. And by having all of these, we talked about the first three questions. You know, is this a pain patient? You know, is this a joint problem? I don't know how to treat them. You mentioned before we hit the go button, the opportunities in the fourth question is who can I refer them to? Not to somebody else, but like maybe I could refer them to me. And maybe I could start to learn how to do this. Can you speak to that? Here's, I'm going to tell you, it's the best kept secret in dentistry. Why? <laughs> oh, if you can become the go-to person in your community who will treat these patients, you will have an unending stream of new patients the rest of your career. I'm, that's the reality of it. The need so vastly overshadows the supply. The demand is so much greater than the supply. I have dentists who I work with in study clubs who didn't do any of this. You know, and it's going to be a learning curve. It'll take you a solid year to get concepts under your belt. But, you know, that's no different than anything else. Maybe two years, but you're going to learn your entire career but you can get pretty proficient quick enough of, to be able to see patients, patients pretty quickly if you follow some steps. And all of a sudden, once your name gets out in the community, it's time to buckle up because your phone's going to be ringing. Yeah. There and you, don't, dentists, you don't spend uh -huh. a ton of money on marketing, do you, Jim? Like <laughs> You're not on billboards and Facebook ads? I spend... And I spend less than a ton. I don't spend <laughs> anything on marketing, to be honest with you. Never. Zero. Yeah. We have never marketed our, never had to, to be completely honest. And I don't mean that to be smug. That's not my point. Really, I, did, I wish I could have said that I had planned all this. I'm giving you a retrospective perspective. It's not like I went and said, I'm going to build this type of practice and that's how it's going to develop. That's not the case. But what happens is, we've kind of got hung up on marketing in terms of marketing to patients. 
how many patients are, how many new patients is a patient going to send you each day? Not many. How about each week? Yeah. How about each month? If you can market to dentists and become the dentist in your community, you know how many new patients you're going to get from dentists? It's not uncommon for me to get multiple new patients a day from a dentist, especially if it's an orthodontist, if it's an oral surgeon, if it's a restorative dentist, if it's a periodontist, because there's no one to send them to. So if we can look at the anatomy with MRI and CBCT, we can understand the anatomy. So if, if, if you want to be the, be, become the person in your community, there's only one thing you have to do. You basically have to make a commitment to image. Now, as I said, there's a learning curve, but you don't have to do everything at once. Set out one morning a week to see these types of patients. And when that gets full, do another morning a week. And when that gets full, add another morning a week. Now, we've talked about this before, but basically this is the restorative diagnostic practice model that I've talked about, where you have one column where you're doing one restorative dentistry, and you have a second column where your assistant's taking diagnostic records. And the practice model is you're going to have a lower new patient exam fee. You're going to have a higher diagnostic records fee. So by the end, the new patient exam, the diagnostic records, and the consult, the fee for those three appointments would be the same as if you were prepping teeth. The nice thing is what it does, it allows your assistant now to be able to generate revenue in the practice and I said this, I think, when we've talked before, my assistants pay out produce my hygienist every day because of the diagnostic records aspect. So what it does, it allows you to build a practice now without a, with, a, with not having a huge overhead that allows you to have a sustaining practice from a profitability perspective. And it allows you to now be able to diagnose patients because if we image, we understand the anatomy. Yeah. If we image, our confidence when our treatment planning goes up exponentially, as does our ability to do a case presentation. The confidence that you have when you're sitting looking at imaging, talking to patients, takes away all the guesswork. So if we can do those things, we can become the person in our community that people will send these patients to. Because they're not going to do it. I promise you they're not going to do it. Right. So be the person in your community who's going to do it then. Yeah. What leads, so there's so much dentistry that spins off that. I always thought when I would diagnose the case, I'd send them back to the dentist. In probably 90% of the cases, the dentist goes, would you do the restorative work, Jim? I just don't want to do it because I don't want to work on patients with joints. I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it. So for years, honestly, that's how the practice developed. You know, I work with a lot of dentists now in study clubs. It's the same story from them all over the country and literally all over the world. Um, simply because the demand is so great. That's that's the reality of it. Yeah. So it gives you a constant stream of new patients where you really you never run out of work to do. Yeah. That's why I think today we need to rethink TMD. Yeah. You know, it's not the pain patient, it's not the crazy woman coming in your practice. It could be the twelve year old class two patient. It could be the could be the patient who's fifty two years old and a guy who's hitting heavy on the left side. It's not always the pain patient. That's what I think really today, especially with most dentists being restorative dentists, you'll be way more confident in your restorative work if you can understand joint anatomy. I promise yeah. you that. And I want to go back to this. So if you're listening to the podcast, you might be listening to the how, and that's important. But Jim's used a very key word here. It's called confidence. And this is what makes him such a great teacher. So we don't know the anatomy. All we have to do as a result of this podcast is get into a systematic way of imaging. Through the right. imaging, you'll create this collective confidence. It's not going to happen right away. But one at a time, you'll go, I think I can do this. I can totally do this. I know I can do this. Wouldn't you agree? It'll, it'll happen faster than you think. Yeah. I mean, it really will. 
especially if you have someone who can you you can work with in your community or you know someone and i can hook people up with i have people all over the country who are doing this so if someone really is looking for someone most of the time we can find them something or we can do stuff online but i mean it doesn't have to take that long yeah you know really you can sit down and look at some imaging and really pick up some skill sets pretty quickly yeah, I got a question for you because we're going to be talking about restorative diagnostic. Now, I'm a geek on sure. the business side of it. We're not doing this for money. This is We're doing this no. for the why and the opportunity. But let me throw a business thing at you. Any expert that's been on this podcast always agrees that 90% of every dental practice production only comes from 10 codes. It doesn't come from 30 or 80 codes. So how does that relate to the restorative diagnostic practice. And I, I'm kind of leading you with that, but like when you look at the breakdown in your practice, would you say that's pretty much true that 90% of your production is coming from 10 codes? You know, I think, yes, it does. But I think really what it leads to is the discussion about being a master. Uh, what's the saying? A jack of all trades, but a master of none. Yes. And I think a lot of times as dentists, we feel that we need to do everything. In my experience, it's hard to do everything well. You know, I can't do endo as well as an endodontist. I'm not treating eight molars a day. I don't have the experience level. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm a restorative dentist. So for me, I picked out the things I liked. I liked prepping teeth. I liked doing bite appliances. I liked doing equilibration and I liked doing diagnostics. But, you know, it's funny. We don't think of diagnostics as a procedure. Right. Diagnostics is a procedure. And diagnostics should be a procedure, as you talk about from a business perspective, that has a per hour fee that allows you to support yourself. The problem is most of the time dentists aren't comfortable treating for diagnostics because insurance don't, insurance usually don't pay for it. Right. And therefore, now it becomes the difficult discussion with the patient because since dentists don't like confrontation, what we do is we kind of hem and haw around it till the end of the appointment. Say, oh, the diagnostic field, be, uh, <laughs> and we kind of spit it out. Yeah. You know, now I'll tell you, I'm proud to tell patients what the diagnostic fee is because I know it is the single best thing a patient can do to understand their treatment options because I have seen patients spend thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours on time for treatment options they had no chance of working right. because the anatomy had never been evaluated by imaging. So for me, I'm really confident talking to patients about diagnostic records because if I don't, it increases the likelihood that they're going to waste money. Yeah. This That's is so, yeah. And then you, I, I want you to wrap this in a bow around the restorative diagnostic practice. If somebody hasn't listened to the previous podcast that you did on sure. this, I'm going to tell them you have to listen to that, but speak to what that is. Restorative diagnostic practice is basically the practice that evolved over the years in my practice. And what it became was I was a restorative dentist but I made myself available in the community. I had people over for lunch. I started a study club. I would do presentations at local dental societies, stuff like that. And what it does when patients have a problem, you're the person they think of. You know, it's different than marketing your practice. I was at a Seattle study club symposium a few years ago, and I wish I could remember the speaker who talked about this because I'd love to give the speaker credit because they talked about marketing your practice versus positioning your practice. This really isn't marketing your practice. This is positioning your practice. Marketing is more sales-based. Positioning your practice, I think, is being a resource in your dental community. So what the restorative diagnostic practice allows you to do is to be a resource in your community for cases that other dentists typically either restorative dentist or specialists may not be comfortable with. So they'll send them to you. You'll do an examination and you'll set them up for diagnostic records at a second appointment. So my typical day might be 
In the first column would be a new patient at 8 o'clock. I might have restorative work from 9 to 12. I might have lunch from 12 to 1. I might have another splint insert from 1 to 2. And then I may have a couple of consultations at the end of the day. So really, it's an awesome practice model. Depending upon how many patients or many dentists you have in your practice, you could all do it that way. You could phase some of the operative dentistry or some of the easier stuff to some of the younger dentists. All depends on how you want to set up your practice. Now, that's the first column. The second column typically is going to be an assistant column. And we leave two hours for diagnostic records. So we could have two diagnostic records in the morning and maybe one in the afternoon. You can do that. You'll start to put up some numbers that allow you now to be able to pay your employees well, to be able to put something away for retirement, to have enough money to go to high quality CE. You know, I, I learned over the years that low quality CE doesn't get you very far. No. I learned it was very commercially driven. I never quite knew. If, I never quite understood if the information I got was accurate information or just an infomercial. So I always tended to spend more money at the higher levels of CE because I thought I could bring it back to my practice more quickly than just someone getting me to try to buy a product. Yeah. So, um, but I always, you know, if I look back at CE, it's the best return on investment of anything I've ever done in my life because it's allowed me to be able to do things in the practice I never would have done otherwise. Yeah. So from an investment perspective, in that restorative diagnostic practice, take some of that profit that you're going to generate and use it to, to really get yourself the best CE you can. Because if you do, you know, the unspoken benefit of that type of practice is you're going to enjoy dentistry more. You're going to be more confident. You're going to be more profitable. You may be able to have more time off with your family. And you'll have a constant demand for your services without having to really deal with third parties or DSOs or what insurance covers. Because most of the time, those patients want two things. They want answers and they want options. Yeah. If you can give them that, they're okay to work outside insurance. Not all, but most patients will be okay. Yeah, so well said, Jim. I want you to talk about Spear Education, what you're doing out there, like what you're doing even this week and your study club. But before we do, give us some final sure. thoughts on why it's time to rethink TMD. You know, here's the reality. Think about implants. Think about how much implants have changed since 1985. I went to my first implant lecture. It was a Corvent lecture. It was a root form implant. Before that, they all used to be blade implants or subperiosta where they'd sit on the bone. It was really the big change in implants. And what you've seen, you would have never thought about putting an immediate implant in. What you've seen is an evolution of a thought process in implants. Same thing with orthodontics. Who would have thought of Invisalign 25 years ago? Same thing with root canals. Who would have thought you'd do a root canal in one day? Same thing with putting a composite on a tooth. Who would have thought you would have etched dentin because we thought that would cause root canals? What's happened is we've evolved in each of those disciplines in dentistry. We need to rethink TMD because we haven't evolved in 75 years. We're still using the same concepts we used 75 years ago. It's time to rethink this. Right. We're missing way too many opportunities. And honestly, we're dealing with outdated information. We don't have the most current information on this subject in our wheelhouse. That's why it's time to rethink TMD. We need to get up to speed and practice in 2024 with what we know today, not back in the 1950s. I love it. I love it. So well said. I'm going to leave all of Jim's contact information, what he's up to in the notes. 
as well as the AES, AARD, and then Spear. Talk about, just tell me what you're doing. Tell everybody that's listening. What are you doing this week? What are you teaching at Spear? Spear Education. This is my, that's a, I love this course. It's the Advanced Seclusion Workshop. It's a three-day workshop based upon the exact things we talked about. So day one, we're going to talk about a lot of cases. We'll talk about imaging. We'll do some treatment planning exercises. We'll talk about how to order MRIs, how to order CBCTs. Day two, we do um, an appliance exercise. We learn how to do diagnostic nerve blocks. We do a lot more imaging on day two. Day three is all treatment planning in the morning, and in the afternoon is implementation. You know, I, I've, I've set it up that way because most of the time by day three afternoon, people's brains are pretty full. So I'm going to switch it away from a clinical discussion. And we this is a turnkey course. When you go home, you have forms you can use. You have letters you can use. You can implement this immediately. So it's one of my favorite courses to teach. We have a great group that comes out and helps with us. So it'll be really cool. So I'm really looking forward to it. That's awesome. And I encourage you guys, check it out. And then tell us about your study club, which I love, which I'm going to go to. I'm going to make my way, find my way. It's called the Chicago Study Club. What is it? Chicago Study Club is actually kind of an interesting thing. It's probably the best kept secret in dentistry. Somewhat by intention, I ran a study club with Mark Piper for 12 years. Mark retired and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I had a lot of dentists call me and say, what are you going to do? So I started another study club program. It's with three other dentists, Kurt Ringhofer, Seth Atkins, and Drew McDonald. Kurt's a fabulous restorative dentist who practices about 20 minutes from me, past president of the American Equilibration Society, member of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. Seth Atkins is a younger dentist who's so fluent in the digital world. It's amazing. I would say he's a computer scientist trapped in a dentist's body. <laughs> But he practices south of Dallas and Waxahachie, so we're going to have a lot of digital content as well. And Drew McDonald is probably the best orthodontist in the country in, treat in terms of treating growing joint-based patients. So the four of us run the study club. We meet twice a year in Chicago. It's two days in the fall, two days in the spring, and we limit the membership to people we know. The reason we do that, honestly, is we want a very controlled environment. Um, study club learning, if you have the right group of people, is the most efficient way to learn. You can cover far more material because you have like-minded people, so you're not trying to convert the unconverted. So you can move through material quicker. You can have conversations on a higher level. Um, if you'd like more information about this, um, grab my information from Kurt, send me an email, and we'll talk. Um, but that's the Chicago Study Club is really, it's, it's awesome. If, if you want to get more into this, that's the part I think that's, that's necessary to do. And I would tell you, if you are excited by this, don't even think about it, just do it. We're going to put Jim's email address, if you're okay with that, in the Absolutely. show notes. So if you're listening to Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, Google, whatever you're listening to this podcast, cast on you can flip up to the notes you're going to see links you can just click right on the links it's going to take you right there and you can check it out jim as always i am so grateful for you brother thank you for being on thank you one of my favorite things to do i can't thank you enough this is a blast and I've got him locked in for shows for the rest of the year because he's just going to share his wisdom with us. He doesn't even have a choice. We call it voluntolding. How do you like that? I just you're just you're just voluntolding. So, <laughs> buddy, I'm so grateful. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. I hope you enjoyed this. This is brilliant stuff from a brilliant teacher who's really trying to help you. So please listen to it again if you enjoyed it. Check out the links that he mentioned. I promise you it will make your life better. If you enjoyed this, share this with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. And until we see you guys next time, keep watching or keep listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.